Hi, Nikita. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright, uh, host of The Wright Show, also publisher of Non-Zero Newsletter. You are Nikita Petrov, publisher of the Psychopolitica Newsletter. Both of our newsletters are on Substack. And this is another edition of The Adventures of Nikita. Um, We had you on a little more than a month ago when you were in Russia, where you've lived for almost all your life. You were in St. Petersburg. This was right before the invasion of Ukraine, right after the speech of Putin's that a number of people found alarming uh, because he was a little more emotional than he sometimes is. The speech uh, struck some people as unhinged. In any event, it seemed to presage a... um, an invasion of grander scale than even those of us who expected an, an invasion had anticipated. The invasion was on a grand scale. Uh, it's starting to look like that wasn't the wisest thing, but in any event, it was. Uh, so immediately there were these sweeping sanctions imposed. Russia became increasingly isolated, not just economically, but in a sense. Technically, uh, you know, and, and media wise. Um, and you started saying to me, you would like to get out of Russia. And a, a kind of a lot of people in your demographic, I would say, which we can talk about, started saying that. There have been stories about this in, in, in the West, um, you know, about all these people who decided they, they better uh, get out while they could. Yeah. Um, you said it was going to be challenging to get out. You weren't sure you could do it. You're traveling with your girlfriend and your dog. I can't imagine that the dog made it easier. Um, so give us an update. Where are you? I'm in Yerevan, Armenia. Uh, it was actually not that difficult to get here. Uh, Armenians are pretty relaxed with, uh, like dog regulations. Uh, but we needed to figure out how to, you know, we needed to get the paperwork ready, we needed to buy tickets. Um, uh, Many flights were canceled at first. Uh, We had tickets uh, for a different plane that got canceled because Russia doesn't own many of their planes. Uh, The the planes are leased, and so when the sanctions were imposed, uh, if the plane that does not belong to uh, a Russian airline company, they're leasing it, if it leaves Russia, then it's going to be arrested. So, like, half of the planes, uh, uh, flights were canceled just because of that. But we figured it out. We got uh, to Armenia. Uh, Russians are allowed to stay in Armenia without a visa. Uh, Virtually endless. As far Ar- as Armenia was I, part of the Soviet Union, right? It's part of the Soviet Union and has a good relationship with Russia. There is, they have their own military conflict uh, that's in the cold phase right now. But with, that, with was, Azerbaijan, that's right. There's a disputed territory, Nagorno Karabakh. Um, they had. I'm not well educated on this, but uh, in like 91, 92, they had a bloody war over it. Uh, And then in 2020, they had another, uh, I think it was the bloodiest since the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And I think Armenian border is manned by, like from three sides, uh, it's manned by Russian, uh, quote unquote, peacekeepers. And uh, there there have been some signs now that maybe that conflict is, you know, something might happen there because Russia is involved in Ukraine, and Azerbaijan feels emboldened to move in, and they took some uh, village recently. But anyway, because of all of that, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just starting to figure out what the situation is. The, the Armenian, uh, the Armenians are very, very welcoming, uh, much friendlier than the Russians back home, um, and uh, and from what I can gather, the war, their war is a part of the reason for that. And I think that it's twofold. I think part of it is Russia did help Armenia, but I think on a different level, it's just people 
who are not at war with Russia, but who have an understanding of what war is. And so, you know, they, they have feel sympathy to people who decided they need to leave because of a war. And they don't, like, Karin and I went to a bar recently and uh, we met these two guys and started chatting and that, in that that's, conversation. That's your, girl, that's your girlfriend. That's right, yeah. And she cried, I think, four times because they're so nice, because they're so welcoming, because they're saying, this is not your fault. You're not to blame for this. We understand what war is. It's not under your control. Um, and we kind of feel like we don't deserve the niceness that we're seeing here. Now, there are three countries that, according to Western media accounts, people like you have been migrating to mainly, I guess, Turkey, um, Armenia, and Georgia. And you told me that your Russian friends who went to Georgia are not necessarily encountering such a sympathetic reaction, right? Yeah, so I haven't been there, so it's all hearsay. Um, there are like specific things you can point to, like occasionally there's a graffiti on the wall that says, you know, Russian swine get out or something. Um, but a graffiti is one person. You know, yeah. it's, it, it seems more prominent than that, but that's one person. Um, uh, most reports, like firsthand accounts that I, uh, see from people that I know are, they're not seeing, like, they're not facing any hostility or anything. People are actually polite, but they feel differently because the country is filled with Ukrainian flags. Uh, you can see that, uh, Georgia feels strongly about this and you know that, there was a war between Russia and Georgia. The relationship between the country between two countries is, you know, not a good one. So you feel guilty. Uh, but I haven't heard any. I mean, I've heard like second or third hand accounts of somebody not being able to rent an apartment because they were Russian. Mm -hmm. But even that, again, like I, I get frustrated with Russians who. Uh, who feel like this is, oh, this is so horrible. You know, Russians are being discriminated against. Uh, somebody couldn't rent an apartment in Georgia. In Russia, when you're looking to rent an apartment, it's very common that you see somebody saying Slavs only. That's like everyday reality. So... You mean we're not say it out loud or you see it in print or... You see what? it in, that was actually, uh, you see it in the ad itself. When you're browsing through apartments, you mm. might want to rent. It's pretty common that you see Slavs only. Uh, I think it's, there was, I think like last year, a few of these uh, platforms, online platforms for renting apartments, decided they're all gonna enforce a new rule saying you're not allowed to put that into an ad. Mm -hmm. And then after that was enacted, the non-Slavic users of those platforms started complaining and asking the platforms to reverse the rule because it's easier to see it in the ad and know that you're, you don't need to call that person as opposed to calling and then finding out that you're not allowed. So it's like... And the non slavs just, just why, quickly... Uh, so that would include like Chechens who are... That's a part of Russia and, and various... Various non slavs Yeah, I think... Yeah. Yeah, I think the reason that phrase is fairly common in Russia is it's safeguard against uh, uh, labor migrants who might rent, like you, maybe one person rents an apartment, but then a whole bunch of them moves in because they don't have money. They need to work at the construction mm -hmm. site somewhere. So it's I, like a landlord would say, this is what I'm concerned about. But my point is, yeah, so apparently everyone, once in a while, there is some kind of form of discrimination of that sort. I'm not scandalized by it. I, I understand why that would be happening. And it's from what I can gather, it's not widespread. You mean um, like in Georgia and now, right. discrimination right. against Russians? Right. Um, the, uh, okay, and how, how widespread is the migration? In other words, kind of how many people in your kind of milieu? I mean, you are, 
you know, relative to some West uh, Russians, more Western oriented. You actually spent time in America before I had ever met you. And I should say you do some work for us. And and uh, one current complication is apparently we still haven't figured out a way to get money to you even in Armenia. And yeah. that's a consequence ultimately of the Russian sanctions, I guess, right? Um, oh, the, that, uh, yeah, like that, that would be the Western sanctions against Russia more right. than the Russian new laws, though. That, that's what that I mean. That, I'm sorry, that's well. what I meant. Yeah. The, yeah. the uh, so, so, your friends were relatively cosmopolitan, young, um, conversant in the use of technologies uh, and social media and, and all of that uh, Western stuff. Maybe some of your friends had traveled in Western Europe. I don't know. But how kind of how many of your friends, what percentage of your milieu has left Russia and 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 are there are a lot of them who still aspire to that. It's tens of thousands, maybe more now. Uh, like two weeks ago, I think it was. I look at the numbers. I think Georgia said there were twenty to thirty thousand Russians that came to Georgia. Twenty to thirty thousand Russians uh, that came to Georgia. So that would be in the course of what two and a half weeks, three weeks since the beginning mm-hmm. of the war. Uh, some of those have left, so they use Georgia as a transit country to go somewhere else. Um, Yerevan, you know, we're walking through the city, there are a lot of Russians. Every cafe you go into, you, you see a lot of Russians. Um, so I don't know, I, I don't know the, the, the exact numbers, I don't think. That but but like, I mean, in uh, terms of, it, it, if, if I had asked you a couple months ago, name your... 20 or 30 closest acquaintances, what percentage of them have left, if any, if any above zero? Um, yeah, I don't, 20 or 30. I, 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 whatever whatever my, circle, my, I don't know my, exactly my, how Yeah, my circle of friends is, is smaller than that. I'm a proud person, but yeah, a lot of them. So like uh, Karina's friends, I think almost all of them have either left or are trying to leave. I have a smaller group of friends that I, uh, you know, in contact with regularly. One guy is staying because his wife is pregnant and uh, they just bought an apartment in Moscow. Another one was hoping to leave to Estonia. That's not going to work anymore because Estonia is not issuing visas anymore. He has a a work relationship with Estonia, uh, like with an Estonian company. Uh, So he's going to Iran because his girlfriend is studying in Iran right now. Mm. Uh, so yeah, people are people are leaving. Uh, everybody, like if you talk about my milieu, quote unquote, broadly, it's on everybody's mind, and a lot of people have left. And, and what is the main motivation? Is it fear of economic collapse? Is it uh, aversion to the growing kind of repression and constraints on speech, on, constraints on connection with the outside world, or what? There's a lot. So there is the, yeah, the expectation of an economic collapse. There is the fear that if you're not going to leave now, you might not be not going to be able to leave at all in some recent future. Mm -hmm. Um, There is, like for Karina and me, a major part of it is an emotional component, which is, it feels like if you stay, you have to become some kind of a revolutionary. Like you can't just go on with your life and not try to fight the regime. Um, and then that does not sound like a great, uh, you know, you, how are you going to fight the regime? It right. looks like from what we're seeing now is you try to do anything uh, you're just increasing your chance of going to jail and those sentences are getting longer. There are mm-hmm. new laws. Um, there is like, I don't think I've seen this enacted yet or rather like the, the long, the, the harshest version of this law. I don't think uh, I've seen it at work, but there's a law that gives up to 15 years for public, uh, I think it's like misinformation about the actions of the Russian military. Mm-hmm. And misinformation is 
anything that doesn't jive with the propaganda and calling the quote unquote special operation a war that's against the law mm. right so so i don't know i don't i haven't had great ideas or much success in fighting the regime while it was more of an option when, when, while there was more of a leeway and now um I don't know. I don't know how to do that. So, Go ahead. so because of that, um, you know, you can't you can't fight and you can't uh, ignore it and just not fight. And so it's it's better to leave and figure out what is the best way you can be useful outside. I guess there's also the chance that if you stuck around, you could wind up conscripted into the army now. You know, last week, uh, the the military started talking as if they were scaling down their ambitions in Ukraine. And I think today they actually did something more meaningful, started talking about specific withdrawals of, of, of troops from around the Kiev area. I don't know if you've heard that. So, so maybe, just- to me, that suggests there will not be a big round of conscription, as had been speculated. But in any event, that's that's an issue, right? Uh, that's an issue. I don't think, like in my case, that's a major issue because uh, I haven't been in the army. I don't have any military training. Uh, I'm older than 27, which is the age until which you're like. Mm-hmm. Russia does have a draft just every year. Some number of people who are not in, like, a- a- unless you have a reason to not be in the military, which is like maybe you're in in your university, then you get, uh, you know, your your. Mm-hmm. Education is now going to be interrupted, things like that. Every year, some number of people uh, go through the military training, lasts a year. I haven't done that. Uh, that thing lasts, like you're eligible for that draft until 27. I'm older than 27. So it's like before it gets to my category, there are a lot of people to go through. Um, so I don't think that's a, for me, that's, that's an issue for if you're 25. Uh, male in Russia, then yeah, you're concerned about that. Um, the hope is, what? Oh, okay, Karina gives me a look. She says, "Here, she thinks everybody should be concerned. <laughs> she, she thinks I'm too hopeful." Um, but that was good anyway. News. I yeah, don't know if you heard the news today. That did seem right. This does did sound like an actual possible commitment it, to repositioning some troops it yeah it looks hopeful uh i'm i'm not gonna you know i'm not gonna just yeah. believe that things are getting better but they it's more than uh than that they're saying that uh you know they're radically de-escalated like uh reducing military action in two directions and that's in order to establish more trust with the Ukrainian government, which is needed because they finally started talking about specific Mm -hmm. uh, steps towards a peace uh, uh, treaty. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we'll see. Um, So they're talking about what are the... I I, I just saw that before we started taping, and I think the versions that I saw from the Ukrainian and Russian side are slightly different. Like, I saw some report saying like, here's what we agreed upon. And then I saw a bunch of reports saying, no, 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 this is what the other side suggests. And we are writing that down as a negotiation position. This is not mm-hmm. what we agreed to. But the things they're discussing are Ukraine promises to not join NATO, to not have a nuclear program. Um, the war stops, the... Uh, uh, there's a list of countries that might uh, be the keepers of the guarantees, or I don't know the, the term, you know, if uh, the mm-hmm. treaty is broken, it's not going to be like NATO is not right. going to be the force here. It's going to be a, a, a fixed number of countries like neighbors of Ukraine. And they, would, uh, and they would not have troops in Ukraine, but they would be committing to defend Ukraine if it was that. Right. And I think another condition is Ukraine, there are, are not going to be any foreign troops in Ukraine. That's right. one of the things they're talking about. And then there is this 
uh, in regards to Crimea and the Donbass region, they're saying um, there's going to be a 15-year period during which the two countries are going to try to negotiate and resolve what the status of these regions are going to be diplomatically, and both uh, pledge to not use military mm-hmm. in that. Uh, which that I sounds hadn't like heard he- that. So it sounds like. That's the way fifteen you're years gonna... sounds to me. Fifteen years sounds to me like uh, uh, you know while Putin is alive. That sounds like. <laughs> the, <laughs> well, the it also sounds. To... It sounds a little to me like forever. I mean, to me, it also it sounds like it may be a way to finesse the issue of uh, Zelensky having to sell to his people, giving away the Donbass, part of which is already effectively not in Ukrainian hands anyway, hasn't been for years, but. Uh, it sounds to me it's partly a way of solving that political problem. Uh, but who knows? I mean, once once Indeed. Putin's gone, I suppose various things are possible. At the same time, and this is this is something I want to talk to you about. Um, I, I think Westerners should not underestimate the amount of political resistance Putin might encounter if he gave away the Donbass, right? And, and I, I don't actually know how much that is, but I, I do think that there, there's a conception in the West that, okay, there's all these people in Russia who kind of know the truth. There are people like you who have been plugged into Western media. They're not buying the propaganda. They don't like the war. And then there's all these old people who, who only listen to kind of state-controlled TV, they watch state controlled TV, they're not really on the internet. And because they're victims of the propaganda, they support the war and, and, that, and that's it. And you know, one, one component of this I've become aware of since the war is what, what I, these people who kind of remind me a little bit of Trumpists in America, j- just in the, in the sense that they are very nationalist, very ethno nationalist. And some of them are aware of what's going on. I, I, I think the, the kind of classic case is this uh, Twitter account called Russians with Attitude. These are a couple of guys who don't sound especially old. They, um, this podcast they, was... Yeah, go do ahead. you know if they're in Russia? I think they're in Russia. I think they're in Russia. Okay. Now, one of them has a German accent because he learned his English while traveling in Germany, I think. But I believe they're both in Russia. The other guy has a very thick, Russian accent. This is a, a, a podcast that uh, had been just a podcast about Russian history and military history. And then the war happened. And suddenly they became these voices who I think it's fair to say are, are pro invasion. I mean, they shared the, and they're smart. This one guy is like super smart. The guy with the German accent. I mean, he's very, he's very sophisticated. He, you know, if you watch the Twitter feed, he, 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 he kind of speaks Western, so to speak. I mean, he makes jokes that people get, mm-hmm. uh, but he's, he's um, pro-invasion. He's clearly aware of what's going on. And, and, and one, thing he, one thing he said, for example, is he said, look, you know, Westerners think like uh, Russians are all these dupes of propaganda. The truth is there's a lot of propaganda in both countries. The difference is in Russia... It's it's very much a, an official top down state mandated propaganda, and he said most Russians know about it. They, they like, by his account, it's like yeah we know we're we're cynical about it. We're ironic about it. The difference is, you guys have a kind of propaganda that's a little more bottom up maybe, but still it's it's you know he's kind of talking about the messaging that I would refer to as the blobs messaging. There is this kind of foreign policy establishment message messaging that you get on MSNBC, on CNN. You get a different uh-huh. version of it on Fox, maybe, and, and that kind of comes and goes depending on, 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 on recent political currents. But anyway, he's, um, he's an interesting case because he's making the claim, basically, that I, I think he would say there's a lot of people who support this war. They do it because they actually share Putin's vision. They, they think that, that Ukraine, or at least big parts of it, are naturally part of Russia. They're sick of the West pushing them around. And, 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 uh, and, and they think 
Ukraine has become a de facto NATO out, outpost and on and on and on. And they call attention to these various things that don't um, get attention in Western media. I'll give you a little bit of an, well, let me stop there and just get your, your, your sense of what the lay of opinion is in Russia. I mean, um, you, you had said earlier that in a way Armenians are friendlier than Russians. And, and I was going to ask, is that true in a generic sense? Or is it the case that when you are in Russia, you, people look at you and they know you're like cosmopolitan. You're well educated. You're right. I mean, they know you're of that. How do they know? What? Yeah. How, do they, how can they possibly guess? But, but, um, uh, no, no. And, and I, I mean, wondered Russians, if one thing Russians you get are, is, is a, is a kind of a nationalist reaction against your demographic. I mean, I have no idea, but go ahead and talk about all this. No, stuff. when I, when I'm talking about the friendliness or unfriendliness in the streets, Russians are just famous for not being very friendly. Uh, the Armenians we met at the bar explained this through climate. They're saying we have a lot of sun, we store some positive energy, we're friendly <laughs> people, you're from the north. Uh, I think that's part of it, but I think I don't think that's all of it. Uh, but uh, to your question, you ask these kinds of questions every time we talk, uh, you know, what's the layout, how many people support this, how many people support that. I don't know how to gauge that, but there definitely are people who support the war in all generations. The further, you know, the older the generation, the more the share of people who support it is. There are people in our generation, uh, there are people younger. Um, I think, I think Karina told me about like a friend of a friend whose boyfriend said he's gonna, like, if this continues, I'm gonna go join the army, I'm gonna volunteer and go fight. Uh, and I think they're younger than us. Uh, that's there. One of the, um, a part of that emotional component of us deciding to leave was the sense, like, one of the things that hit the hardest is when you're driving and you're seeing a car that have the Z symbol, which has mm -hmm. become the symbol of the, I don't know, support of the Russian military, I suppose, is what they would say, uh, the people who put this on, on their car's windows. Um, but yeah, when you see that, there's a BMW of all mm -hmm. cars uh, with that symbol, uh, and it hits you. There is... You know, these people are there. Uh, they have the state's sanction. You know, they're going to be protected. If there's some kind mm -hmm. of a conflict, they're going to be protected. Um, and if they knew you, they would not like you, basically. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it depends on, like, we actually had a conversation, like the one conversation we had with a random Russian about the war after the war started was with a supporter of the war at a bar, uh, a guy in his 40s who's a member of... Uh, he laughed, or rather I laughed when he said, like, we, we've been talking for half an hour or something, and he's, he's going, well, I, you know, I belong to this organization. I don't know if you've heard about him. He named the organization Nod. This is like a national liberation movement. And I haven't heard of them in a while, but they were prominent like 10 years ago. And I laughed when he named it because it, to me, it's like saying I'm uh, in the Church of Scientology or something. They're really on the fringe of uh, nationalist thought. And I remember... You laughed out loud? Up, yeah, and he understood why I'm laughing. He, he like when he said it, this is this organization, like when he understood that understood that I know what the organization is, he, we've talked long enough for him to expect mm -hmm. this kind of a reaction from me. Okay. Um, but anyway, what I'm saying is he was nice. We had a nice conversation. Uh, it was respectful and polite. We don't agree on anything. And it was difficult at times to like, I don't know how we're going to continue this conversation because I think you're on the side that's really literally evil there are people dying and you're supporting this it's hard to like but we managed it was a you know so it's not like everybody who supports the invasion is gonna try to beat me up mm -hmm. or disagreeing with them but boy it's 
you know, if if we go through this, if if country the country does have a future, there are gonna be uh, these difficult conversations to have between the people who supported and people who didn't. And I don't know how you're gonna. That that's not gonna be easy. And is is your sense that this guy basically, you know, knows what's going on in the sense that he doesn't buy Putin's more outlandish claims? And and I would say first of all, I, I think a lot of Westerners don't appreciate that a lot of the things that Putin says that sound crazy, it's more like they're massive exaggerations than fabrications. Like like one thing you heard a lot in the beginning was neo-Nazis, they have a Jewish president. He's hallucinating. Well, no, I mean, there is, you know, this Azov Brigade, for example, that's fighting particularly in Mariupol. They have a neo-Nazi history. They have some neo-Nazis still in the Azov Brigade. You know, there is a history here. Uh, and, you know, when when he talks about uh, uh, genocide, well, yeah, I wouldn't say there's, there's genocide, uh, but that term has come to be used pretty loosely. And I think a couple of things he'd point to are that if you, if you look at the uh, kind of ongoing low level civil war in the Donbass, where there's a part that's effectively Russian controlled, there have been more civilian casualties, according to the UN's numbers, kind of way more on the Russian side than on the Ukraine side. They're not huge numbers, but, you know, uh, and then there's the fact that, yes, there is what you could call, um, you know, kind of repression of the use of Russian language. It's more on the books than it is real, maybe. But but there are there are the kinds of things that that often in situations like this in other contexts, leave aside Russia, do get amplified by one party and and described in extreme terms, kind of like genocide. So no, that's not going on. Uh, genocide, as I understand it, isn't going on. On the other hand, and so on. You can kind of go down the line. It's like it's like no, we're not making biological weapons that we're trying to fly over to Russia in birds in hopes of killing slobs. But it turned out there was a bio, there, there is a biological lab. Who knew, right? And, and so uh, this is a long digression by way of saying that I, I don't think either side has a completely clear view of things as a rule. But anyway, back to my question of like, how many people are there, do you think, that support the war and are not just propaganda dupes. They, they kind of understand what the actual situation on the ground is. Well, again, it's hard to, to gauge that. I think the majority of the people who support it are just going along with whatever the official narrative is. And I think the reason, like, you would need to try to analyze it from a psychological kind of angle, why people do that. I think it's most of it, like if we're talking about the majority, I think it's just, you want to support your country. You have been uh, hearing about how we're encircled by enemies. Uh, the, the thing they say is, uh, I mean, that's Putin's uh, pitch, right? If we didn't attack, we would have been attacked by NATO through Ukraine. So they're going to repeat that. Um, I think that's the, like the, the majority of the supporters of the war, I think, is people who don't, it's not that they've looked at what's happening and formed their opinion. They've mm -hmm. uh, taken it uh, in bulk, you know, from uh, what the state says. That guy we talked at the bar was different. He's clearly... Uh, putting his worldview together himself and he has his his little organization uh that one you might you might get a kick out of it it's uh it's the kind of worldview that i've learned to be able to entertain i remember when i picked up a newspaper of this organization like 10 years ago i thought like i was surprised and i laughed and i thought wow how warped a worldview can there be uh and then over time, I've learned to kind of see, okay, I can see how you can, can view the, uh, the world this way. So they're, unless they've changed their official kind of stance, um, but that organization thinks that Russia uh, is like a colony of the West, like the Russian regime 
has been established by the people who won the Cold War. So it's the, we're, we have a colonial government here. Established so Putin, by, wait, Putin is a puppet of the West in this scenario? Except for Putin, who is a lone warrior within oh, the system. Oh, so it's kind of like QAnon, Trump, uh, right? In other words, there is extensive infiltration of the government, but this one man That's can right. save us. That's right. And so what Putin is trying to do is, uh, like this was, they were saying this in like 2012, and they were calling for um, a change in the, I guess, like they won the, the, you know, the constitution has been changed and it gave more power to Putin. Um, but uh, they were saying Putin needs more power because he's fighting against the system that's been established and is still being controlled by the U.S. Yeah. And he is this lone patriot in this um, in the system trying to, they call it revolution from above. Mm -hmm. So he's de facto the president, but his hands are tied because he's within this regime uh, and he's going to try to do uh, try to have this revolution from the top, which in their view, like this is what it looks like, uh, you know, Crimea and then this and, and, and that worldview also well, wait, Crimea, allows you to, what do you mean Crimea? And I mean, Crimea wound up in Russian hands. I mean, of Putin making these bold moves is him. Oh, I see. That's the he, he's the guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you have this worldview, you're actually are able to embrace even the sanctions that, you know, are, all right, so all of these Western businesses are going to leave Russia. We're going to have to learn to build our own stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are being uh, forcibly cleansed. And now we're going to have to build the Russia right. we've been wanting to build. Yeah, these Russians um, with attitude guys, when the sanctions came, were like, great, no more IKEA bullshit furniture. We'll make our furniture out of Russian wood from Russian trees and so on. No yeah, more McDonald's. I remember the furniture we had before IKEA showed up. I don't want that furniture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, there is with these things a certain amount of romanticism. The... Um, but it is kind of like the Trumpist thing, like, yeah, we don't need Japanese cars. We're going to make everything in America. They're just stealing our jobs and so on. The, um, yeah, uh, there's, there's a difference there. America produces more stuff than, and, and has more Russia. technology than Russia. Yeah. yeah. Russian cars, no, they're what, not great. What's the brand? What's the big brand in Russia? Avtovaz would be the, mm. if you're talking about the consumer uh, cars. Mm. The... Um, so uh, back to this idea that Russia is encircled by enemies, I assume that one thing that gets attention, I mean, in other words, one thing that these people do know that I think hasn't gotten so much attention in the West is that since the Trump years, America, Trump didn't especially want to do this, I think. He kind of got pressured into it. But America has been supplying more and more weapons to Ukraine, sending more and more advisors over. The, these Ukrainian troops are trained by America, and, and I'm sure, sure the line is, uh, as far as why the invasion isn't working out well, I'm sure the line is, we just waited too long. We were right all along. The Westerners were coming. They were encroaching on, on uh, you know, nearby lands. More and more, they were uh, controlling the Ukrainian government, filling them with arms, training them. Uh, but, but in any event, the question is, I assume, I assume that thing gets more gets a certain amount of attention in Russia among war supporters, that, that Ukraine is kind of had been becoming a kind of de facto NATO outpost, even though it wasn't part of NATO. Sure. I mean, if you, like, most of what I hear from the supporters of the war is not very coherent. It's not like... Uh, just that, just just like if just reading a coherent text that makes sense within itself, that is kind of a rarity. Uh, and TV is famously uh, over the top, and uh, it's people shouting and uh, more emotion than. And now they they have to change their tune uh, on the go, and it's hard. I mean, because early on they're saying it's going to take three days, and then we're going to celebrate in Kiev, and that, mm -hmm. that didn't happen. So now they need to figure out what do they say. And I'm guessing there is not 
like you need to invent that, you need to figure out what do you say that would be within the parameters of what is allowed on state media and would not be misconstrued as you going against the regime, but you need to have some kind of an explanation. So there's a lot of chaos, um, but I think you could um, make a, a, a fairly reasonable uh, narrative that would defend the position of the state. You know, I'm emphatically against this, and uh, uh, you, I, what I'm saying is, I could try, if you want me to, I could try to present like a defense of Putin's worldview that would make sense, I think, uh, even though I disagree with it. Well, I gather the, the main elements are the West is encroaching militarily. He can kind of make the case for that in a sense. NATO has expanded. As I said, Ukraine has more and more Western weapons uh, and training. The West is encroaching culturally. And this is a little bit like Trumpism. In other words, there's these globalist cosmopolitans who are kind of corrupting our, our culture. Um, the, uh, I mean, as for Ukraine, there are these things I mentioned. Russian speakers are being uh, uh, oppressed and so on. And in fact, Ukraine wasn't a coherent country to begin with. Look at how divided it is linguistically. Parts of it have historically been associated with Russia at various times, certainly Crimea, uh, to some extent the Donbass, and, and, and so on. Um, and uh, I assume these are some of the main rhetorical elements of, from, of supporters of the war. Am I, are, am I missing major things? Right. I would, I would also point to there's this interview uh, with Aristovich, he's a presidential advisor uh, of Zelensky's, uh, that struck a chord when, you, when I first saw it. It's from 2019, and he predicts the war and predicts it pretty precisely. Like, he, you know, there's a follow-up from the interviewer and saying, well, when, when you say a big war with Russia, what do you mean? And he describes what is happening now, but he's doing is is in 2019. This is a Ukrainian, you said, who's describing. That's right. That's uh, a presidential back. advisor to the current uh, president, and uh, he's like giving military briefings daily now. Um, and his explanation of the situation is: Listen, Ukraine can't afford being a neutral country. We don't have the resources. It's very expensive to be truly neutral, you need your own army, and it needs to be a strong army. Um, we can't afford that. The choice we have is either we're joining NATO and we're in that camp, or we're going to be subsumed by Russia in 10 to 12 years. Uh, joining NATO means a big war with Russia before we're able to join. Like, if, if we're making moves in that direction, if we're given a roadmap for becoming a member of NATO, Russia will attack before uh, that happens, before we're actually a member. Uh, and there's going to be a big war, and those are the choices. A big war, or becoming part of Russia in 10 to uh, 12 years. Then the interviewer goes, well, which of these is better? And he says, a big war is better. A big war, which ends in our victory, doesn't, in that interview, he doesn't define what vic victory means. I assume it's more like a defeat of Russia, like Russia not being able to be victorious than like an actual uh, like expulsion of the Russian army from the Ukrainian territory. But he phrased it that, you know, a big war, we win, then we join NATO. So he's saying this in 2019. This is a Ukrainian official. This is how they see the situation. Uh, so we're not talking about true independence of Ukraine as a state. It's like which side they're going to be on in this divide mm -hmm. between two military forces. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, Putin decided to move in be before it's too late. He says, you know, we tried to do it diplomatically. There were these Min the, the Minsk Accord that were not, it was not um, enforced. Which would have given so, a, autonomy within Ukraine to the two provinces in the, in the Donbass. They, they might have had effective kind of veto power over Ukraine's aspiration to join NATO, for example. But in right. any event, that didn't really happen. It was one of Putin's demands before the invasion, uh, I think, a, a restoration of or a compliance with Minsk. But 
Right. So so that that that's the worldview. Like if you are looking at the situation as there are these two basically empires and they're trying to figure out who's going to have control of this region, who's going to put their military bases in it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. For me, I guess I need to study and, and try to figure out why these empires need to exist at all. Why can't we mind our own business and try to improve the educational system or healthcare or roads instead of, you know, our territory is not maintained well. Why do we need more? Uh, and I guess the same goes, I don't exactly know why America needs military bases all over the world. Uh, but if you're looking at the world through that lens, there are these two forces. It's just the logic of the situation is one of them are going to eat Ukraine up and Putin wants to be the one uh, mm-hmm. who does it first because if he doesn't move, then, then America is going to. Well, what we need is an international network of people who ask the question you're asking, <laughs> is this really necessary? <laughs> you know, like, uh, I mean, on both sides. You know, is yeah. is it is it so necessary to establish um, to have this kind of expansive conception of 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 your influence? I mean, Putin would say, and I think he's right. Uh, is like we're the expansive. You know, I think he'd say, look, America is is insisting on having influence very far from its borders. We're insisting on having influence just barely off our borders. Uh, now, and then Americans would say, well, we're more powerful, we're more prosperous, whatever. I don't know. It, it's a long argument, but I personally wish that all sides would revisit their premises and and, and ask whether uh, all of this is really necessary. I won't go go, go into that, but... Um, I just heard a new conspiracy theory today. Oh, good. Um, and, and it's this, that the reason the war started from with with an american sanction uh in fact uh it's 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 in the interest of america and and putin is playing a role that he was given and the point is during the trump's presidency uh people saw that there's a real danger of a new cold war between america and china and that would be really bad because those are really really powerful mm. countries mm-hmm. and so there needs to be somebody to resolve the tension there needs to be a bad guy Putin's playing the role of the bad guy now mm. europe is going to be united and uh not worry about china there is a real evil right here uh, he needed to do something so horrible that europe can't stand uh, uh stand out of the way and and ignore it another part of that plan is America doesn't like the European Union as an economic competitor. And so these sanctions, mm. uh, uh, you know, the oil prices rising and just general situation in Europe getting worse would also damage uh, the European Union. And so this is all master planned by the US. Uh, and Putin is just playing a role that he was given in this theater. So he's in this conspiracy theory. He is a knowing participant in the conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I I've heard that. You know, I, I I haven't listened to the guy explain. This guy, like, he used to be on Russian TV all the time. Uh, I don't think he's anymore. But I, I guess the reason I'm bringing it up is, like. Like you have this thing where you ask about actual facts or, uh, you know, how the, the situation can be viewed and how the Russian propaganda machine is using it. Like you can take these disparate facts and put them together, exaggerate some, and then it makes sense sort of from the, you know, the point of view, like you can present this narrative, the Russian propaganda mm-hmm. can present this narrative. And uh, yeah, but if you control all the media in your country, does it matter much how uh, close to reality your propaganda narrative is? Well, you know, you're, you're going to have a different set of facts. You're going to uh, throw them around a little differently. 
if you, you you still have the goal, we are in the right, they are in the wrong. Uh, praise the leader. You can do that. Like you can get to that result with yeah. whatever reality you throw. I in. want to ask you about that. The media landscape. I mean, my immediate reply is like these Russians with attitude, guys. I think they have a reasonably clear view of the actual world. And, and I assume Putin needs people like this, right? He needs, uh, and well, this gets back to the media. The media isn't completely, I mean, Russia is not impervious to accurate information, right? The, the, uh, it more than it used to be, more than it was even a couple of months ago, right? Because they have shut down some of the relatively independent media. I want to talk to you about kind of what they shut down. But uh, but first of all, I want to say I was surprised to see that that the, quote, state controlled media is maybe not as state controlled as I thought. I sent you this link to this TV show. This is like considered state TV. In fact, I think maybe this TV show host is is known as a Putin propagandist. I'm not sure. But anyway, there was a guy on the show saying, hey, look, if we can't even beat Ukraine, you know, he was really seemed to be critiquing the 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 way this war was going, and set and, and in a way that I would think Putin would find threatening. But this was on state TV, so was I wrong to be surprised by that? Or like, how tightly controlled is? Let's just for now talk about what, what is thought of as kind of the state the state media, right? Like the TV, yeah. what the old people watch, um, how. How tightly controlled is that? Very. Uh, that Do you guy think this like, was kind of staged in effect? Like this guy is playing a role? The guy who's raising so these is, questions? Of- there is, uh, generally speaking, there is a little bit of that. There is a little bit of like there, a token, you know, critic, critic of mm-hmm. the state uh, who, who will stay within the lines. That, that uh, happens, uh, you know, to some extent. What you're talking about, I think, is more of a consequence of how chaotic and unexpected the situation is, right? So that that's what I said uh, in, when you, started in talking. Ukraine. You mean? Yeah, like if you look at the what the TV was saying early on is this is going to be quick and easy, and uh, that they, they had this thing uh, showing some like timetable. It's like you know, lunch, victory in the war, evening celebration uh, kind of thing. Uh, now, uh, the whole thing, like, it, it, it's clearly fucked up. It's, it's clearly not going according to the plan. Um, these people themselves, the, the people in the media, are being hurt by it. Like, the show, the, the host of the show that you're referring to is famously, he owns a villa in Italy can't go there anymore, not his villa anymore. That's been arrested. Uh, he's under sanctions. I think uh, he can travel to the places he likes to travel to, right? Uh, a lot of these people uh, have a lot of money and children in uh, Western universities. And, you know, they spend their free time, not in Russia, but uh, in the, uh, you know, in, in, in the more developed world, let's say. it. Um, so they're... They're in distress, <laughs> yeah, and uh, and the show that you uh, send me a segment from is live, so uh, oh. you know the guy says what he has to say at this moment. You can't at that. I mean, you can interrupt him. And I'm sure there's a lot of interruption. There is always a lot of interruption on on these shows that is happening, uh, but uh, it's like the the line is not clearly like what do you say in this situation is not clearly. Defined, I so guess. So this guy may you, himself be regretting this, thinking, "Oh shit, I went too far. I'm in trouble." Maybe I don't right. know. I, the guy, the guy that he, I, I don't know that that particular person. Um, uh, and on the other hand, you can also interpret what he's saying. Um, we, is is we can't stop. Like we do need to go all the way and defeat uh, Ukrainians, and well, our I, tanks I think- need to be in Kiev. Yeah, but even that is taking issue with what apparently Putin has decided to do. That's what I meant. I mean, he was saying he was seeing signs of a pullback and going, no, you know, and that I, that's what I was surprised by. He seemed to be critiquing the emerging I, intentions I of, know, of the regime. I don't know if at the time 
it was a signs of a pullback as much as signs of not being able to move forward. Okay. Uh, like right now, they're saying we're gonna mm. try to move to to a peace treaty and we're gonna stop fighting in these uh, two directions. But at the time, I think it's just the Russian army was not able to move. Mm. Well, forward. what I thought was maybe his role is to create political space for Putin to say, "Look, it's going to be a long, hard slog, but we're not giving up." Right? In other words, that was my conspiracy theory. Like that's that's his role in 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 the puppet yeah, show. I, I don't I don't think it's I don't think it's that precisely like. Mm-hmm. You have 24 hours in a day to pretty much talk non nonstop about Ukraine. Uh, and you need mostly to create this emotional background of uh, people being on the edge and, uh, you know, people being in a war uh, mood. Uh, and so every particular utterance is not so important. Right. Uh, you need the the general right. ambience. So th- this was seized on in the West. That's why I was aware of it. But it was just a tiny, mm. it was just like a little snowflake in the, in the storm. And yeah. My, my mother does watch uh, Russian TV every now and again. Uh, and she says that in these last few weeks, you see them being like thrown off. And uh, actually people saying, like there was some guy who said, uh, you know, we're talking about the denazification of Ukraine. Uh, this is insane. There's, you know, who are you talking about? Uh, what what does that mean? It's not like a Nazi regime is established in Ukraine. That, that can be. Uh, so that would be a real, like going against uh, the narrative. And that guy for years have been following whatever the narrative is. So he's not known for speaking the truth, but it's like this particular situation is so chaotic. They're thrown off. Uh, you know, every particular guy is making decisions on the spot. What's gonna, what, what he's going to say, at, you know, on this taping, or mostly we're talking about um, live shows. Is there any sense that maybe Putin will not be able to hold on to power? Like when you talk There's to your hope. mother or anybody else, what's that? There's hope. Yeah, I mean, th- that's a sentiment. Uh, I don't know how realistic that is. and And also how... Like, if it doesn't hold on to power, then what exact scenario plays out? And is that scenario a good one? Because Mm -hmm. simply removing Putin does not mean good things start happening. Um, But there's talk about it for sure. Uh, Just recently, there was uh, an official statement from uh, the government. I forget who it was. I I forget the official... Uh, but somebody very high up uh, said that the uh, talks about the uh, possible coup are nonsense and none of that is happening, which the prevalent wisdom is if the Russian government says this is clearly not happening, means it is maybe happening. Uh, so, you know, it's the rumors and the, the speculations are uh, present enough for the government itself to comment on it. So, yeah, yeah, people talk about it. It must be very unclear who would take over if not Putin, because it sounds like there is a very small circle of trusted advisors, and they're all kind of part of the problem. I mean, the defense minister is one of his most trusted advisors. He clearly didn't have a clue. Uh, Well, he is not. There is a whole thing about him. Like, uh, he's not very present in the media, hasn't been for a few weeks. And, and then he did talk. show up in this tape, and 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 by one account on the BBC, but I didn't see this confirmed anywhere. By one account, he was kind of slurring his words. I think that must have been wrong. I didn't see that anywhere else. Uh, I didn't you didn't hear that, that right? Okay. Know. So um, the but uh, so that like the, the the fact that he's he's not in the picture that can be interpreted in different ways. It could be that Putin is unhappy because he also Putin put some people from the FSB under house arrest. Uh, Apparently. FSB, the part of the FSB that's uh, dealing with foreign... And, and, and the agents. FSB is the successor to the KGB. So it's an intelligence agency. And these were the ones who dealt with intelligence about, for example, Ukraine. And they that's were right. apparently... Put in a house arrest seemed weird to me because normally when you want to scapegoat, if you just want to scapegoat them and blame them, you, you know, you fire them. It, when you put them under house arrest, I'm wondering, do you consider them a threat? Are you thinking they've been leaking stories to Western media or something? It seemed weird. The way and, it was interpreted in, in the Russian independent media is uh, he's genuinely 
pissed with the level of intelligence he was getting. Yeah. Like he thought we're going to be, Russians are going to be met as liberators. And there is, like, he bought some part of his propaganda. And then turns out it's not a, a tiny, uh, you know, group of Nazis at the top of the government who the people hate. Turns out, uh, actually, the country doesn't want you here. Um, so that, that was an interpretation that I saw in, in Russian media. And I think that's become truer, that thing about sentiment in Ukraine over the last decade. And I think he just lost touch. I, 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 that's what I've heard is that, especially since 2014, there's been kind of a shift in that direction. And, you know, he's an, he's, he's an older guy. He's older than me. Uh, people tend not to adjust their worldviews a lot. He hasn't been there. And I think he's thinking back to 10, 20, 30 years ago. You know, he, he did his honeymoon in Ukraine, you know? Uh, <laughs> famously, the, uh, he, he, he would say, he used to say with some amount of pride that he doesn't use the internet. He doesn't have time to right. watch TV. He gets his information in these folders and there's a signature at the bottom of each document. So if the information he is given turns out to be incorrect, he can hold to account the person who was who brought the information. This is, I'm old school. I'm not. I'm not yeah. getting my news from the internet. I'm getting my yeah. news from people who, whose job it is to give me the news. Well, it turns out these people weren't very good at their job, or they were, or they were afraid not to give him what he wanted to hear, or some combination. Right. 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 The the um. So back to the media um, and how free it is or isn't. Now, in addition to what's thought of as state control, there have been these relatively independent outlets. Now, I, now these, these uh, well, anyway, like, like one of them, uh, Novaya Gazeta, just suspended operations. They said they'd gotten two warnings from the government, the third warning and you're out, and they'd rather suspend operations than be put out of commission for because I guess it's easier to get revived that way uh, if you just suspend. But so, so how, how, how free were they and how free were these uh, TV stations that were shut down or, or whether it was technically voluntary or not, I didn't know. But right after the invasion, um, there were several so-called liberal outlets on radio or TV. There's Novaya Gazeta, which I gather is a kind of a print and internet thing. How, how, how independent yeah, those, were they? Uh, Unless you go into a conspiratorial kind of mode, they were independent. Uh, it, it's just small, you know, Nova Gazette is not read widely. It, it is a, a, an old independent uh, newspaper. The uh, chief of state, what do you call him? Editor-in-chief got uh -huh. the Nobel Peace Prize recently. Right. Um, are they on the internet as well as being in physical print? They are, yeah, but they're not, uh, they're not very popular. Um, by by my estimation, uh, there the, there's a radio station, uh, Echo of Moscow, that uh, also was banned. Now they've been in operation. I want to say since before the fall of the Soviet Union, or right after, maybe they they established, but like early '90s, and this is the first time they're they're not on air. Um, they. Uh, and there are different ways that people look at them, how independent they really are, but they clearly like if 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 you take the position that they're not independent, then the explanation is they are allowed to be uh, a free platform, and like people like Navalny when he was still you know when he was not in jail. He would mm -hmm. go to Echo of Moscow and say whatever he wants to say. So he, that was a platform that really uh, was free to different voices. Uh, and the conspiratorial angle would be they're allowed to do that so that there's like a, an outlet that you can control mm -hmm. if you need to. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy, the, their editor-in-chief, he, he has met with Putin many times and he has relationships like friendly kind of relationships with some of the propagandists he uh, and and he would say this is his job i need to maintain some level of friendliness with these people so that my reporters can do whatever they want whatever you know they they can be mm -hmm. free uh on air uh but no in terms of what they 
what was on air. That was a, a real free um, radio station. There were a few online publications. I mean, they're still there. Uh, they're just not accessible from Russia unless you have VPN. Uh, Medusa, Media Zona, those are... Um, Which virtual private, private network, right? A kind of software that allows you to... To mask your IP, to pretend that you're not in mm -hmm. Russia. Uh, so they, they're still there. They're operating. Uh, Medusa has... I, I think that their story is there was... Uh, there used to be a different outlet that was taken over by the state. And the team that was working on that outlet decide, okay, we're going to leave, we're going to quit, and we're going to uh, establish a new one. And they decide we're going to do that in Latvia so that they can take over this one. So they're uh, physically outside of Russia, but it is a Russian media operation. That's still an operation, it's just you need to uh, be tech-savvy enough to get uh, access to them. So I guess but, Putin yes, will have... I guess Putin will have to invade Latvia then, it sounds like. Yeah. So um, since the war, not, since not the war, serious, but since the war started, uh, pretty much everything is shut down. Like, mm -hmm. I think everything is, is probably technically correct. Like, media outlets that would be able to print anything but uh, the official uh, line, uh, they're, they're all against the law now. And then what about things like social media? Have they shut down? Like Facebook, I, I, Instagram, Twitter are all out. And was that uh, the Russian government doing it? Or in some cases did, I, I forget how it happened. Did, face, did, did, did some of these companies say, well, we're getting out or I, in a way, I guess. No, 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 no. That's, that's the Russian government. That's, uh, I think, I'm not sure if it's in all cases. Uh, maybe with Twitter, it was different. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, mostly, um, it's like Facebook bans an RT page or uh, a page of a Russian ministry or, or something. And then the Russian government says, you got to reverse the ban. And they say, we're not going to. And then mm -hmm. the Russian government says, well, then we're blaming you. Well, not sure then. I mean, I, I personally would rather have them still around and not banning the uh, government outlets, but that's just me. The, that, um, that's also, I mean, whether that's the real reason or a pretext. Yeah. So, um, is there a sense, is there widespread sense, well, first of all, among your kind of crowd, but secondly, do you, do you sense what, whether there is within Russia of kind of imminent economic collapse? In other words, if we don't get some relief on these sanctions, we're just totally screwed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The prices are rising uh, quickly. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, businesses have stopped working. Uh, you know, I, you laugh all you want, but IKEA is the one place you can get really good furniture in terms of like compared to, uh, you know, what's, what's made domestically. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's a lot. Like, I told you the, the planes are leased. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it, the planes that are not leased, the planes that are owned by Russian airlines, they have parts that are bought from abroad and they need to be maintained. And, uh, you know, if, if this continues, then in three years, you just don't have any planes. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of these uh, examples from different industries. Uh, I guess they must have some hopes, you know, China might fill this role, uh, somebody else, I don't know, is there anybody else that, that was still well, so Well, in, India, Russia? there's a number of countries that haven't really condemned the invasion, Brazil, India, yeah. I would think India and China are the two big possible lifelines. So yeah, China. They, they, maybe uh, they can readjust, but it's not going to be the same. Yeah, it's going to be like, uh, you know, a few steps back to the Soviet Union. It's not like we have to have good cars and good furniture and fly right. around in those planes, you know. But if there's inflation, serious inflation already, I've got to think that that is part of the pressure that's leading to the repositioning of the, the troops themselves. I, I mean, the, the, the seemingly yeah. increasing I mean, ability of the Russian government to peace talks. I've got to think he's starting yeah. to feel political pressure to get some of the sanctions 
believe. I think so. I think the, the old line is there's a battle between the TV and the fridge in Russia, right? So the TV is giving you the propaganda and it's winning until you have something in the fridge. Uh, when you don't have food, maybe you're going to stop buying, you're going to stop mm -hmm. supporting the, uh, you, the people you in power you that made it so. You can't eat propaganda. Yeah. Um, so do you think, uh, kind of you and or your, your crowd, do you imagine going back to Russia while Putin is still in power ever? Not in my plans. Uh, the crowd more broadly, uh, people have different takes on it. Some, some are planning or hoping at some point. Um, I, I mean, I, we don't have long-term planning. Uh, we're trying to figure out how, you know, how can I get paid so that we uh, can continue just our, our life for now. Um, I don't know, but, but while Putin is in power, I don't see how that would be wise or productive in terms of like me helping the situation at home or me trying to live my life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not thinking about that. Uh, and, you, and you've got yeah. a, a mother and a brother in Russia. Your brother's still there. Yeah, my brother's, he was in Thailand when the war started. And as I was trying to get out of Russia, he's like, I think I'm going to go back to Russia. I'm not totally sure why. He actually had reasons, like he has a dog and he needs to like deal with some, you know, property and stuff. Uh, so his plan is, is he, he wants to just deal with his shit that needs to be taken care of in Russia and then leave again. Mm -hmm. My mother is still there. Her biggest source of anxiety was that I'm in Russia. Like... Well, she's, she's glad that you're that you managed to get out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I can help her more than uh, more if I'm not in Russia because I'm able then to get paid and send stuff back home. Uh, yeah, I mean, my particular situation is in the last what seven years or something. I've been working with Americans. That's not mm -hmm. allowed anymore. So. Uh, so yeah, I don't see signs for me, you know for, for for me to go back to Russia. I don't see how that would be a good decision. So it would have been illegal suddenly for you to keep. Uh, is that well, because of not, Russia no. or because of America? No, okay, it's, it's just impossible practically. This while is you're in yeah, Russia. practically. This is the sanctions. Yeah, I mean there is from the Russian side there are also like if we were able to get my salary into my bank account, I would have to sell 80% of it, uh, you know, dollars to rubles as one of the measures that are, they, they've enacted so that the ruble doesn't plummet. I they actually have been, have been surprisingly successful in that. I mean, ruble started falling down. It used to be like 75 rubles per dollar. At one point, it was 130. Uh, and that's, you know, in a short time span. But now it's like 87 right now I'm looking at it. Surprisingly, they... From all accounts that I hear, the people like the economic part, the people in the central bank, mm -hmm. are professionals and they know what they're doing. Yeah, and uh, and I think the woman in in charge, the, the head of the central bank, tried to resign after the war started, and uh, she was not allowed to. Well, they are demanding but, that uh, countries that have criticized the invasion pay for oil and gas in rubles. Yeah, I don't know how that's working out. And it sounds like from what you said, they're demanding that if you bring foreign currency into the country, you, you have to convert most of it into rubles right away. And that, that That's what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. So what were you going to say before I just interrupted you? Were you uh, I forget now, but answering your question, like my particular situation, from two sides, you're, you know, the, the American sanctions don't allow for money to be transferred into my account at all. And then if that would be solved, then I need to sell 80% of that into rubles. Um, and generally, like in, in today's climate, working with Americans on some kind of a media operation, that doesn't sound like a patriot. That sounds like a traitor to me. You know, you mean, so you mean if you were in Russia, you would be considered that? 
Yeah, there, I mean, there's not like. So if you well, kept example, working with us, able... which you've been doing, I mean, you've been working with me and and with the Glenn Show, which has been on the kind of Blogging Heads Network, which we I kind of run and so on. But but are you saying that that, that uh, that's just not tenable to to have a job that's described that way? In Russia? Yeah, I, I mean, it's not like technically, right, as of today, I'm not breaking laws, but the way things are going, uh, that just doesn't look good on you. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be able to talk to you like I'm talking mm. right now about what's happening in Russia. I would be like, I am breaking mm. Russian laws. I keep saying there's a war in Ukraine. I can go to jail for that, theoretically. I don't think mm. people have gone to jail for that uh, until now. They have been fined. Uh, or like, uh, you know, if you're protest and people have gotten like small sentences, like a few days. But I think theoretically, with the current laws that are on the books, I could be going to jail for years for talking to you right now about the war the way I'm talking about it. Mm. So, yeah, that doesn't sound good to me. Well, the good news for you is that when I try to present Putin's perspective and argue that maybe NATO expansion has played a role in antagonism, antagonizing him, I do get accused of being a Putin apologist. So, could be that your your relationship with me could be your ticket to power in Russia. Who knows? Right, I'm a very subtle Russian propaganda outlet. This is all part of my plan, which which I've been uh, yeah hatching in collaboration with people I can't mention who are in Moscow. Um, I'm, I'm kidding. The, uh, so what, is there anything else you want to say? I, this is pretty much, um, I, I, I guess, you know, that uh, let me say one more thing. It makes me kind of sad to think of kind of your crowd as leaving in mass just because there are a lot of talented, well-educated, creative people we're talking about. And kind of, if you think about the long-term future of Russia, I mean, I totally understand why you left. But if you think about the long term, if there's a post-Putin future where things are a little more liberal, uh, you know, Russia will be poorer for having lost this. Well, this so, so I've been thinking about this in, in the following terms. I think a lot will depend in terms of the future of Russia uh, and the future relationships between Russia and Ukraine, like the people of Russia and the people of Ukraine, and just anything that you know involves Russia, I think a lot of will depend on what happens uh, with these people who left. It could be just a wave of immigration and people will integrate into different countries and that'd be it. It could be that we are able to form a community that is capable of productive work on behalf of Russia, Ukraine, you know, just like organize and figure out how to send money to Ukraine to people who are actually suffering now. Like, you know, I, I feel kind of guilty, like you're asking me, am I okay? Is there anti-Russian sentiment in Georgia? There are people who are dying. There are people who are in basements hiding from bombs. Uh, there are people who you know, left Ukraine, leaving Ukraine right now and living in Russia right now, those are very different scenarios. I'm fine. You know, I got on a plane and I, uh, you know, we are at an Airbnb. Um, when you're living, leaving, like, you know, I have a friend who was in Kiev when it started and she stayed in Kiev for a while and she would hide in the basement when uh, the city is being bombed. Uh, she eventually left Ukraine hoping to come back soon. That's a different scenario. So if the Russians who left managed to organize and send some humanitarian help to the people of Ukraine, that would be a step. And if we make a few of these steps, we might be able to, you know, uh, the right Russian economists working in, in the UK now who are smart, who could draft a system of a program of reform for post Putin Russia, right? There are, you can do a lot of work. You actually can do way more work, I think, on behalf of Russia when you're outside of Russia mm -hmm. right now. 
if you're doing this kind of work inside of Russia, you're going to jail probably pretty soon. So we'll see. Uh, I, 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 I can't say that I'm hopeful about the overall situation. Uh, you know, the Ukrainians have already suffered enormously, and I hope that a ceasefire is going to happen soon, and 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 peace treaties will, uh, peace, peace talks will actually lead to something. But it's not going to happen tomorrow. In terms of Russia, um, you know, I can always imagine. You, you can always imagine a rosy future. How uh, you know the, the Putin regime falls, and and beautiful people uh, with a lot of talent come in and, and solve it, I don't think it's going to be easy. You know, even if Putin leaves, like there are many, many problems within the country. There are some problems that are like Chechnya is there. The head of Chechnya is a gangster who has total reign over that territory. And he was given that by Putin. If there's a, you know, a liberal democratic president, what are you going to do with Chechnya? Are you going to have another war with it? Are you going to allow it to continue the way it is? Because then there's no law on your land still. Uh, or what? How, how are you going to negotiate with Kadyrov? Yeah. So there are a lot of these like ways it can, um, can go poorly. You can imagine just, uh, it's, it's not hard to imagine just the repetition of what happened with the Soviet Union. You know, the regime does become weaker and then it falls apart and then the country falls apart as well. Mm -hmm. um, in which yeah. case, so in, anyway, if, if the situation in Russia changes to something, either to something positive or to something just less uh, predictable and, and more people are able to play their part, well then, whether we've used, the Russians who've left, used the time before this change productively will mean something. It will matter. Mm -hmm. uh, or, I mean, productively in terms of like collective action and uh, preparing for doing something in Russia uh, as opposed to productively in terms of building your own, li your own life in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, I, I applaud that spirit. Uh, and uh, thanks for taking the time. Nothing else you want to say? I don't think so. I mean, yeah, I don't think so. I've I've been in a. I, I feel like I need to be trying to say things, but at the same time, I feel like, you know, what am I, what am I to say? Um, I'm just hoping that that the war is going to be over soon. Well, the good news is there have been relatively encouraging signs over the last week and even today. So uh, we'll see. Meanwhile. People can find your work at Psychopolitica newsletter, P S Y C H O P O L I T I C A, right? Substance. Yeah. And your Twitter handle is what? Uh, Nikita S. Petrov, one e word. P R O B. Uh, mine is Robert Ryder. And we'll uh, probably check in down the road. Um, Sounds good. Glad you got out. See you around. Yeah. Bye. Bye.